Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's really good to be with you. Uh, I must admit, I thought during the worship, Sam looked somewhat undressed without his guitar in front of him. Uh, but it was great to see uh, the liberty that that gives you, Sam, mate. So uh, I, I think if that carries on, we'll probably see Sam Poe going across the front before, uh, before too long. Uh, my name's John. Uh, I'm uh, one of the pastors here at the church, and uh, it's a real joy and a privilege to be uh, sharing with you uh, this morning, if we can get the, the presentation on. As uh, those of you who are spring regulars know, uh, we're in the, uh, the, the beginning part, I think, still. It would, we're uh, halfway, is it? Wow, that surprises me. Seems like we've only just started. We're doing a series talking about the different names uh, that the, the Bible give to God. They nearly all start with Jehovah. On the Sundays, we're looking at the names of God that begin with Jehovah. So, Jehovah uh, Nissi, we've been singing about, for, for example. Uh, and then in our midweek meetings, we're looking at other names that the Bible has, which doesn't necessarily have the name Jehovah attached to them. Uh, and as we pointed out, this is nothing to do with Jehovah's Witnesses. It is just the original Hebrew name for the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. So, uh, let's get started. All of the, uh, the preachers, I think, are going to talk a little bit about their own names and nicknames just to, uh, to have a little bit of an icebreaker. So, my, uh, my full first name is actually Jonathan. Uh, there's only one or two people that call me uh, Jonathan, normally when I'm in trouble. Um, my mom did used to call me Jonathan when I'd been particularly bad, and, uh, and occasionally Carol calls me Jonathan as well um, when I've been particularly bad. Um, and that's about it. I don't think anybody actually other than that calls me Jonathan. But in Hebrew, it's a Hebrew name, Jonathan, and it actually means God has given or gift of God. Uh, and, uh, and throughout my life, throughout my, well, to be honest, throughout my life, quite a few times I've heard people say, he thinks he's God's gift to women. <laughs> it, it also stands for loyal friend. Uh, because of the story of David and uh, Jonathan in the, uh, the Old Testament. So actually, I think it's a really, really nice name. I do like my name, Jonathan. I'm, uh, I'm very pleased that my mum and dad chose to, uh, to call me Jonathan. Uh, but um, we're also saying a little bit about nicknames. And uh, the very first nickname I ever had, there was only one person that called me by this nickname, but it's the most special one of all. Because when I was a little lad, the nickname that my dad gave me was Tiger. It was prophetic because he, obviously he must have known that I was going to be a great golfer. And, you know, it, I was the golfer before Tiger Woods. But my dad called me Tiger. Um, but no one else, no one else has ever called me Tiger. Just my dad. And probably when I got to about eight or nine, he stopped calling me that. But, but there's actually a verse in the Bible that says... Uh, if we're a believer in Jesus, that one day in the future, we are going to be given a new name. We're going to be given a new body, but we're also going to be given a new name. Now, you don't know what your new name is going to be, okay? But if, and, and my dad passed away about four years ago, but if I heard my dad call me Tiger today, I would know that it was my dad's voice. And I would know that Tiger was my special name. And I want you to know that one day, if you're a follower, you will hear your heavenly Father speak to you in a voice that you will recognize. And he will give you a name, and you will know that is your flipping nickname from God. Isn't that wonderful? So if you don't think of anything else today, perhaps that's just something to, uh, to, to think on. Uh, the names that your parents give you. Um, for whatever reason, that my, my sister's name is Nicola, and my dad always called her Blossom. Uh, why? I don't know. But, but that stuck, and she was called Blossom for quite a while growing up. Anyway, that's it. Um, I have had more nicknames uh, as I've been growing up. Um, the nickname that I actually use uh, on my email, if any of you email, is that quite a few of my friends call me Johnny Two Shots. Um, <laughs> Johnny Two Shots. Now, I have to say, the number of times I have had to explain that is to do with golf and not drinking, okay? <laughs> As a church pastor, the number of people that say, oh, you must like the odds. Uh, no, no, it's, it's the fact that uh, 
when I, when I had a higher handicap than I do now, I used to get given two shots on certain holes, and I was apparently very proud of saying, I've got two shots on this hole. So that was a Johnny Two Shots game. And of course, just at Springs, um, I'm, I'm called the captain. And um, that, again, is nothing to do with uh, anything to do with leadership abilities or, or anything to do with the military. It's just the fact that I was the golf club captain uh, when spring started and the, the name of captain kind of stuck. But today, today, and I know Paul loves to call me the captain. He always says, I love to call you captain. Uh, but today, uh, we're looking at a wonderful name of God. We're looking at the name of God that is Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Jireh. And that means God will provide. And I've got a key scripture for you. Uh, I can't see what's coming up. That's it. So this key scripture, which I want you to latch on to, is this. My God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now, the thing is, it says he will supply your need, not your wants. Okay? Your needs, not your wants. So just latch on to that. But we all have basic needs. There are basic human needs. So I'm going to ask the, the next slide, please. And uh, we'll just go through this. Uh, so what are our basic human needs? Well, I've just thought of some. Uh, but these, can we have the next slide? Sorry, uh, Rach. Yeah. These are just some of the basic needs that we have as human beings, and I think you'll all agree with these. We need food. If we don't have enough food, our bodies will die. We need shelter. We need clothing. We, we need jobs. We need money. We need rest. We need enjoyment. We need relationships. Without these basic needs, we either cannot function at all, because some of these needs are so basic, if we don't have them, we'll die. Some of the needs mean that emotionally, if we don't have them, we'll be dead emotionally. Because, for example, if you lived as a hermit on an island uh, in the middle of the Pacific, you could cope if you had all of these other things without relationship. But you would actually be a very ill-formed person uh, if you didn't have these. So these I've called our most basic needs. And Jesus taught about these. Next slide, Rach. Jesus said this about our basic needs. Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For after all of these things, the Gentiles, the non-believers in this case, they seek those things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things. Um, Jesus is almost a bit dismissive of these basic needs, isn't he? He's saying, look, don't worry about those. Don't worry about your basic needs. Your heavenly Father knows that you need these things. He provides for the birds of the air. Surely you're more valuable than the birds of the air. Your basic needs are sorted. Don't worry about your basic needs. Now, as Christians, we are taught to look for the needs of other people. And actually, not exclusively to Christians, but one of the things that differentiates us from non-believers is the fact that, that if you're not a Christian, if you're not a believer, if you're not careful, your whole life can just be based on seeking out your basic needs. I know many, many people that have been so committed to uh, their jobs and their careers that they've sacrificed everything for that. And, and some people live a life which is just based on fulfilling their basic needs. But as Christians, we're meant to be at a higher level, and we're particularly told that we need to look after the needs of others. That's a really, really important thing. But when we look at these basic needs, if we think of God, Jehovah Jireh, just providing these basic needs, at the very worst, we're almost treating God like a waiter, bringing what our needs are. We'll, we'll signal to him uh, and we'll place our orders in faith and we'll receive what we've requested. Well, that doesn't really seem how it's meant to be. More often, we're not quite as trite as that. You know, if we're a bit more spiritual, we don't kind of just have a shopping list where we say, all right, Lord, these are my needs this week, you know, provide those for me. We're a little bit more spiritual. So we will talk 
quite rightly about God providing our needs and acknowledging that our new job, uh, our new car, our new home, our new church, our new church building, um, these are answered prayers. And they are the provision of God, God providing these basic needs. And it's quite right that we should actually uh, acknowledge that these basic needs are being provided by God. Okay, so I'm not saying they're not. And they are really important. If we didn't have these basic needs, as I said, we'd, we'd, we wouldn't function at all well. But too often we stop when we think about Jehovah Jireh, the provider. We stop at the basic level. It's so easy to do. You know, um, we, we need this. It's such an important thing. And, and you can focus on your immediate needs to the exclusion of other needs. So actually, there's a deeper level, and we're going to go even deeper than this, I have to say. There's a deeper level than just our basic needs. So as human beings, we also have some deeper or some emotional needs. Can these come up on the, um, the slide? Thank you. So these are not exclusive. You know, there'll be other needs that you may think of. But some of our deeper needs are also provided by God. Some of these deeper needs are things like protection, strength, wisdom, peace, freedom, significance. That's an interesting one, isn't it? Do you, we, we don't even need to be significant. We need our, to feel that our lives have some worth. Identity. Identity is a really key thing. I, 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 again, in my business life, I knew so many people whose identity was tied up in what they did. My, my old business partner, who I had a tremendous amount of respect for, I probably learned more from him than anybody else in business I've ever known. Um, but he was about 15 years older than me. And when he retired, he struggled immensely because his whole life, his whole identity had been in being the businessman about town. He had, he had a respect. He was known in the town that we worked in, in Kidderminster. And as he retired, he really struggled because he lost his identity. The Bible tells us our identity is in God. What we do is important. Who we are is far, far more important. Uh, and guidance as well. These are things. Now, these things are really, really important. Can I have the next couple of slides, please? The Bible speaks about all of these things that God will provide. Jehovah Jireh provides these things, our basic needs. Then at a slightly deeper level, he provides these things. So James 1.5 if any of you lack wisdom, ask God, and he'll give it generously without reproach. Philippians, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. John 14, 27, peace I leave you. My peace I give you, not as the world gives do I give you. Let not your heart trou be troubled and let it not be afraid. John 8, 36, if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Freedom in God. Psalm 91, 14, because he loves me, says the Lord, I will rescue him. I will protect him, for he acknowledges my name. Jeremiah 6, 16. This is what the Lord says. Stand at the crossroads and look. Ask for the ancient paths. Ask where the good way is. Ask for guidance. Walk in it, and you'll find rest for your souls. So God, Jehovah Jireh, provides for our basic needs. He provides for these somewhat deeper needs. And today it might be that some of you are saying, I need wisdom. I need discernment around this issue I'm facing. I, I, I feel pretty weak. I need God's strength. I just don't have any peace in my life. I need the peace of God. I, I feel constrained and tied up. We've been singing about chains being broken free. I need God's freedom. I, I'm really scared about this situation I'm facing next week. I need God's protection. I just don't know which way to go. I need God's guidance. Jehovah Jireh, our God, will provide all of these deeper emotional needs. Now, everything I've mentioned today is really important. And we're going to give space in a, in a few moments' time for you to ask God to supply any of those needs that you may have. Some of the things I've talked about, some of the things that you may mention. It may be that you are coming today 
and you have some needs. Um, we're going to be taking communion as, as this, uh, this message wraps up. And we're going to build into that a space where you can ask God to meet those needs. That's really, really important. But I want to talk and I want to finish this message today by digging even deeper, if that's okay. Even if it isn't okay, I'm going to do it. We've got the basic needs. We've got these slightly deeper emotional needs that God, Jehovah Jireh, provides. But I want to go even a little bit deeper than that. And we're going to look, just for a few moments, at the story of Abraham and Isaac. Because the first time in the Bible where God is called Jehovah Jireh is to do with the story of Abraham and Isaac. So I'm going to read this story to you. Hopefully the, uh, the, the words will come up behind me. But this is found in Genesis chapter 22. Those of you that have been around church for a while will know this story, and we're just going to open it and unpack it just a little bit more. Okay? So Genesis chapter 22, Abraham uh, was an old man. He was over 120 years old when this incident happened to him, and, and it's one of the most famous stories in the Old Testament. Now, it came to pass after these things, God had done so much for Abraham in his life. After all the things that had happened, God tested Abraham. And he said to him, Abraham, and Abraham replied, here I am. God said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey. He took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. So Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. Uh, the lad and I, tiger and I, I don't know, the lad and I, the apple of my eye, are going to go yonder and worship and we'll come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. He took the fire in his hand and he took a knife and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, my father. Abraham said, here I am, son. He said, look, we've got the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering so the two of them went on together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. He then bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you've not withheld your son, your only son from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked. And there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. So the name Jehovah Jireh is not a name that God kind of announced himself. Some of these names have been given to God by people that have said, this has been my experience of God. When God is introduced as Jehovah Jireh, the provider. It isn't the God who provides snacks for us, food for us. It isn't the God who's given us a new car or has met this bill or uh, has given us a new job or has introduced us to this wonderful person that we're going to end up marrying. 
When we are introduced to Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides, it is in the context of the most profound physical need you can possibly imagine, the loss of life. That's when God is Jehovah Jireh, at the point of the loss of life. Abraham was commanded by God to take his son Isaac to Mount Moriah. He was told he'd got to sacrifice him there. Now, Isaac was known as the son of a promise. Isaac was a miraculous gift from God already. Abraham was 120 years old. Sarah, his wife, was 100 years old. When Isaac was born, it was a miracle. He'd been promised, and God had made other promises. God had promised that he would make Isaac into a great nation. Isaac was God's provision, or so it seemed to Abraham, until God said, now sacrifice him on this altar. We can't imagine it. It's our culture, our context. It's so hard to imagine the concept of sacrificing your only son. But Abraham obeyed. He obeyed in the belief that God would provide a miracle of some sort. He didn't know what was going to happen, but he trusted God. He obeyed God so much that the Bible tells us, just a little line that we've read together, that Abraham set off early the very next day. That's incredible, isn't it? He didn't prevaricate. He didn't drag his heels. Gosh, if God told me to do something like that, I don't think I'd be setting my alarm early to get out of bed and do it. Do you know what I'm saying? This is unbelievable obedience. It was a three-day journey. Imagine what Abraham felt on that journey. He then leaves his servants, and Abraham and Isaac are traveling up the hill, Isaac carrying the wood as Jesus carried his cross, the father carrying the fire and the knife, and then the boy says, where's the lamb, Dad? What are we going to do? Can you imagine Abraham at that stage saying to Isaac, God's going to provide a lamb? And he did. A ram caught in a thicket. Now, the amazing thing about that experience that Abraham went through is this. When Abraham looked back on that incident, his memory was how beyond his possible comprehension God's provision has exceeded his expectation. So Abraham named that place by a name that spoke nothing of the trial that he'd gone through, but spoke everything of God's provision. He gave it a name that spoke nothing of his obedience, but everything of God's faithfulness. He gave it a name that spoke nothing of the agony and the suffering that he had gone through, but everything of God's comfort and deliverance. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will see, the Lord will provide, was what Abraham decided to call that place. What about us? When we look back on our lives, and I can look out today, and I can see people are going through things. I know some of you, and I know some of your lives are tough at the moment. And it's easy for me to say this, but I believe this is from God. When you look back on the issues that you are going through at the moment, how are you going to recall this time? How are you going to think about it? Are you going to say, gosh, I remember how I felt when I was going through that. I don't want to go through that again. I don't think I could cope again. Are you going to remember how you've suffered? Or are you going to be able to name the time that you are going through now, Jehovah Jireh, God came through this situation for me and I rejoice and I'm not going to look back on what the difficulties were. I'm going to look back through the lens of remembering what God's done for me. Let's give the mountains we've scaled names that commemorate what God's done, not the troubles we had on them, the deliverances that we received from God That's the way we should do it. As I said, the name Jehovah Jireh was given at the most extreme time any of us can imagine, at the point of physical death. Do you know what? It wasn't Isaac's time to die on that mountain. That wasn't God's plan for Isaac to die. But if you look in Genesis, that was from Genesis 22, you only have to turn a few more pages 
and you'll read the story of Isaac's death when he was an old man, when he had a family himself, when he was the father of a nation. But Isaac died. Isaac died. One of my old school and uh, old church pals, same age as me, died this week. We'd been praying for a miracle, and, and it didn't happen. Um, when you think about your immediate physical needs, whatever they may be, and when you think about your emotional needs, whatever they may be, important as they are, they will actually pass away. They will not be permanent. Even when God has provided an amazing thing for you, in years to come, it won't exist anymore. But our God, Jehovah Jairus, promises to provide for us at the time of our greatest crisis. In Genesis, Abraham's only son was set to be sacrificed, and he was saved by God's miraculous provision. In the Gospels, God's only son, Jesus, was sacrificed as miraculous provision for all people, for all time. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting, eternal life. Jesus was the last, the final sacrifice, the flawless lamb able to redeem all sinners and pay for all sins once and for all. Jesus is God's perfect and complete and absolute provision. Jehovah Jireh, God himself, provides the sacrifice and the fulfillment for our deepest needs. So I'm going to get just slightly liturgical on you now. I want us to respond to start with to this message by uh, saying a prayer together. So, and I'd like you just, because I think this is significant, I want us to stand and we're going to say this prayer out loud together. And in this prayer, we're going to pray for our basic needs. We're going to pray for our emotional needs. But we're also going to pray and acknowledge that our greatest need is to have a relationship with Jesus. So um, if you can put the prayer up for me, Rachel, and uh, could I ask you please to stand with me? And I'd like us to just read this. Can you all see the screen and is the prayer there? And then we're going to go straight into a time of communion. Okay. So can we say out together, please? Heavenly Father, we come before you with hearts full of gratitude and awe at your provision in every area of our lives. You are the God who feeds the hungry, guides the lost, strengthens the weary, shields the vulnerable, and grants eternal life to those who believe. Lord, we thank you for your daily care, providing for our physical needs. You are the God who gives us our daily bread and ensures that we lack no good thing. Help us to trust in your provision and to share with those in need, recognizing that everything we have comes from you. We seek your wisdom, O God, the wisdom that comes from above, pure and peaceable. Guide our steps, lead us in your paths, and help us to discern your will in every decision we make. May we lean not on our own understanding, but acknowledge you in all our ways. In our weakness, you are our strength. In our fear, you are our courage. We rely on you, Lord, to be our rock and our refuge. Uphold us with your righteous right hand. Renew our strength and help us to stand firm in the face of life's storms. Above all, we praise you for the gift of eternal life through your Son, Jesus Christ. Thank you for loving us so much that you gave your only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. May we live in the light of this truth and share this hope with others. 
Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Um, we've got some people that are going to be distributing uh, the bread and the wine for us. If you want to come out, uh, Sid, Carol, I think Cynthia, are you coming as well? And uh, Simon's also going to come and help us. Um, I'm going to say some words, and, and actually perhaps if, if you could um, distribute the bread and the wine as I'm, as I'm saying these these words to us. So try and concentrate. I realize that you're going to be getting um, the bread and the wine, but just try and concentrate on these words as uh, our, our servers bring the bread and the wine to us. So let's just take a moment. Jesus actually said, very truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. St. Paul writes, whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. Everyone ought to examine themselves before they eat of the bread and drink from the cup. As you receive the bread and the wine, will you just keep it together, hold the bread and the wine, and we'll eat and we'll drink together in just a moment. So a prayer. Lord Jesus, we bow before you in humility and ask you to examine our hearts today. Show us anything that's not pleasing to you. Reveal any secret pride, any unconfessed sin, any rebellion or unforgiveness that may be hindering our relationship with you. We know that we are your beloved children, having received you into our hearts and lives and having accepted your death as penalty for our sinfulness. The price you paid covered us for all time. And our desire is to live for you. We remind ourselves that on the night before Jesus was betrayed, as they were eating, Jesus took bread and he blessed it. He broke it and he gave it to his disciples and he said, take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to them saying, drink from it all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So Father, we thank you for this bread and this wine. May they be to us the very body and blood of the Lord Jesus. We'll just wait until everybody's received the, the bread and the wine. I think everybody's got it. Thanks, Carol. Thanks. So we take this bread. It represents the life of Jesus that was broken for us. We remember and celebrate your faithfulness to us and to all who receive you. We can't begin to imagine the agonizing suffering of your crucifixion, Lord Jesus. Yet you took that pain for us. You died for us. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your extravagant and unmerited favor. Thank you that your death gives us life, abundant life now, eternal life forever. As you instructed your disciples, we receive this bread and we eat it in remembrance of you. Let's all eat together. And in the same way, we take this cup representing your blood poured out from a splintered cross. We realize, Lord Jesus, that you were the supreme sacrifice for all our sins, past, present, and future. Because of your blood shed for us and your body broken for us, we can be free from the power and the penalty of sin. 
thank you for your victory over death. You took the death we deserved. You took our punishment. Your pain was indeed our gain. And today we remember and celebrate the precious gift you gave us through the blood that you spilled, which we take and drink now. Amen. Lord, every time we take communion, we want to recommit our lives, our hearts, our thoughts, our everything to you. Fill us today with your powerful and precious Holy Spirit. Help us to hold this fresh remembrance and the story that never grows old close to our hearts. Help us to share its message faithfully as you give us opportunity. Help us to serve others in the power of your Holy Spirit. We thank you, our God, Jehovah Jireh, that you provide so much more than our basic needs. You provide so much more than our emotional needs. You provide the very life that we enjoy and experience ourselves. Thank you for your precious gift. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.